This segment is labeled The View from Congress. It's actually Congress plus AAAS, because we have a hybrid presenter. It's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Rush Holt, quite remarkable figure in Washington and nationally. You have his bio. He was uh, just installed in the middle of February as the Chief Executive Officer of the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. For the preceding 16 years, been a distinguished member of Congress, as you can read, member of many caucuses, and a real positive force in a difficult time in our U.S. Congress. There are a few things about his background. Uh, we're not in that little bio, so I've taken the liberty of spicing it up a little for you. First of all, he is from West Virginia, and his dad was the youngest U.S. senator. Served for a number of years, unfortunately passed away when Rush was six. His mother later was Secretary of State of West Virginia, so quite a family tradition of public service. He went to Carleton College and then New York University and earned a PhD in physics. He began his career teaching at Swarthmore College, which is about five miles from where I grew up. And um, he was teaching physics and public policy in those days already. Uh, maybe that was after the, white, the uh, AAAS when you came back and you taught public policy. No, nope, from the beginning. There was a guy who worked for me, a physician epidemiologist from the CDC when I was in OMB, who uh, uh, wanted to get some experience about the budget. And we took him on on the staff at an entry level year's experience out of a government position. And a few years later, he was the president of Swarthmore College, David Fraser. And in fact, he wrote in the New England Journal of Medicine that epidemiology should be a basic topic for every undergraduate. And it's a pretty good idea. In 1982, Rush went to Washington as a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow. This has been a magnificent program of the AAAS from 1973. And um, he is described in other bios as saying it was a life-changing experience and much followed. He uh, soon moved to Princeton as um, assistant director of the famous Plasma Physics Laboratory. And while there for a decade or so, toward the end of that time, he ran for Congress. And one thing you have to know about running for office in this country is it's unusual to win the first time. It was true in his case. Some Republican held the Republican district, but he must have learned a lot because two years later, he ran again and he won the primary this time, and he also beat the incumbent, and then served 16 years. Now, one other story I thought you might enjoy, given this era of big data and information technology and communication via television and entertainment, is that some of you will remember that IBM, the great fanfare, uh, t had their Watson tested against the then all-time champion, I think, on Jeopardy, somebody who won 74 straight times or something like that, and he and another person, and Watson vanquished both of them. So as I gather bits of the story, they set up another demo of Watson at the Congress, or at a place where members of Congress agreed to come, and Rush was enlisted to be the subject to show off Watson on the presumption that if Watson could beat those guys, what is it to beat a congressman? And of course, you all probably know, the Rush beat Watson. At least they did one round and Watson retired, <laughs> ignominiously defeated. What apparently was not known, Rush told me, was that many years earlier, he had actually been on Jeopardy and won five times in a row, so they were hardly dealing with an unprepared congressman. Now there's a special story. Rush, we're delighted to hear your remarks, both about experience in Congress and about how you engage people through the AAAS. Uh, it's a wonderful example that you've set for us. Thanks very much. Thank you, Gil Oman. And thanks to the organizers and sponsors of, of this program. Uh, uh, let's not wait so long to do it again. 
this is, uh, I think, really important. Uh, I'm delighted to be with this uh, distinguished group of speakers, and I thank you for putting it together. As you heard from Gil, uh, earlier this year, I voluntarily, um, after 16 years in Congress, went from uh, who's who to who's that, and um, have since uh, started at uh, the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And I've discovered in my time there, uh, my now month at the AAAS, uh, that many people that I would expect to know about the American Association for the Advancement of Science don't know all that much. Uh, uh, they know about the Fellows Program, and by the way, um, Ralph, I did uh, get the information here, there, this year, 286 year-long fellows, 33 congressional fellows, sponsored by uh, the AAAS and 31 other scientific and engineering societies, uh, one judicial branch fellow, 247 executive branch fellows, all but five funded by the agencies where they work for a year or two, um, and five Gates Foundation Global Health Fellows. Uh, 68 fellows in USAID, 33 in NIH, uh, similar number in the State Department and in NSF, uh, somewhat fewer in Department of Energy, Department of Defense, EPA, and so forth. Um, Corps of Engineers, FDA, and so forth. That's, uh, uh, that's what you were looking for uh, earlier this morning. It has grown from, well, when I was a fellow, three dozen fellows uh, to now more than 250. Um, a success not just in numbers, but in the effect that this has had uh, in the government. Um, now, when I was sitting in the AAAS orientation program in the fellows program, I remember a talk. Uh, they, uh, the AAAS puts together really an excellent uh, introductory program for these fellows. And I remember uh, someone, uh, actually I believe it was from the late great Office of Technology Assessment, said, now you scientists have to understand that here in Washington, facts are negotiable. Um, <laughs> And that got me thinking really hard about kind of what is science? What are facts? What is the point of science? And it is this fundamental question about what is science and why science that is not talked about, is not communicated, and I would argue is at the root of all the problems we've been talking about today. Um, Lewis Thomas once said, science is the shrewdest maneuver for understanding how the world works. Now, what a great definition or, or expression. For definition, I would say, it is a way of asking questions so they can be answered empirically, so your work can be communicated openly, and the questions, your answers to the questions can be uh, uh, verified. You express them in a verifiable way. Not many members of Congress understand that. Not many scientists, I would argue, think about that and communicate it. And that leads to all sorts of problems. Um, I think um, if we did a better job of stripping away the methodology and the terminology of science, members of Congress and the general public would be less likely to think of science as a checklist of what is known and what is unknown. That is a very dangerous uh, un misunderstanding uh, of science. Jerry Wiesner really understood this. And I want to look back now 50 years, actually somewhat more than 50 years, to help us think about what is a real appreciation of science in government and in society. What would it look like? Now, I, I think I met Jerry Wiesner a couple of times. We met once or twice, but I felt I knew him. 
uh, from his work on the ABM uh, treaty, uh, from his ar arms control work, for his work uh, as an early proponent of and actually chair of the board of the Office of Technology Assessment. Um, he, um, his, his book was almost a Baedeker for the world in which I began to move into then and, and have lived in since. His book was entitled, Where Science and Politics Meet. Um, his work on the test ban treaty, you know, as a youngster, as a teenager, I had the privilege of working as a page in the Senate and I got to watch the partial test ban debate. Uh, I didn't realize that that was as much the work of Jerry Wiesner as anybody. Um, and so I looked at what Jerry Wiesner um, wrote in Science Magazine, our, the AAAS uh, flagship publication. And there were a couple of interesting things calling for uh, better study of, of, of better data about the uh, workforce in science and engineering and that sort of thing. But what was most impressive to me was something he wrote after returning from Arlington Cemetery in November of 1963. He wrote an appreciation of his boss, John Kennedy. And in this touching and stirring appreciation, he praised Kennedy for his thoughtfulness and his hopefulness and his sense of history and his striving for excellence and his vision of what the world could be. This um, five or six page appreciation of Kennedy in Science Magazine talked about the place of science in that administration and the desired place of science in our society. Wiesner recalled an eloquent extemporaneous talk at the National Academy of Sciences in April of 1961, one of two talks that Kennedy gave at the Academy um, in his less than three years in office. And President Kennedy spoke of the use of science in public policy and said, quote, for those public officials called upon to make decisions, and he, he explained in what areas, in fiscal policy, and in agricultural policy, in international policy, in disarmament, arms control, in matters of national security, in conservation and development of natural resources. We must turn in the last resort to objective disinterested scientists who bring a strong sense of public responsibility and public obligation. So let's hope that one of the outcomes of this Wiesner Symposium is we will help identify, build, and encourage these objective disinterested um, scientists with a strong sense of public responsibility and public obligation. Wiesner went farther in describing Kennedy. Uh, a couple of years later, in October of 1963, a month to the day before he was killed, Kennedy spoke again at the Academy of Sciences. There he emphasized, quote, the importance of basic scientific investment, uh, investigations, I beg your pardon, the contributions that science can make to uh, international objectives, and the interdisciplinary and intercultural aspects of science. Wiesner quoted Kennedy, but if the basic research is to be properly regarded, it must be better understood. I ask you to reflect on the means by which our society can assure continued backing of fundamental research in the life sciences, the physical sciences, the social sciences, the nat and on natural resources, on agriculture, on protection against pollution and erosion. 1963. Together, the scientific community, the government, industry, and education must work out the way to nourish American science in all its power and vitality. Beyond the Academy speeches, Wiesner spoke of Kennedy's support for graduate education that he put into the 1964 budget, uh, and his understanding of the role of basic research in training new scientists. 
So let's hope that the Wiesner Symposium will help, help to foster such a view of the basis of science and appreciation of basic research and equally in the life sciences, in the physical sciences, in the social sciences. Wiesner went on to talk about the president's interest in helping international development through oceanography, satellite communications, international warnings of epidemics and adverse effects of drugs, an emphasis on science education in the Agency for International Development, weather forecasting, economic desalination, and agricultural research on everything from boll weevils to hoof and mouth disease. He, Wiesner pointed out that Kennedy um, created a, or reformulated an office of science and technology, energized the Presidential Commission on Science Advisors, as it was called then, and established the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, which he considered to be a scientific agency. And he appointed an Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Science and Technology, and talked about commerce, science, and the arts. And he sought to have a senior scientist in every cabinet department. Of course, there is the well-known moonshot. Um, and Kennedy, about that, said, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard, because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one we are willing to accept, one we are willing, unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. Kennedy's push to ratify the Partial Test Ban Treaty, his support for the Pugwash Movement, his promotion of international scientific exchanges and scientific cooperative activities, were, as he said in his inaugural address, to invoke the wonders of science instead of its terrors. So let's hope that the Wiesner Symposium will help to lift up that view of science that's intended to uplift people everywhere, that science is integrated into all policy, domestic and international. Now, I say all this not simply to extol John F. Kennedy. John Holdren, if he were still here right now, might say, look, my boss is that good, too. Um, and um, I, I don't say this, you know, I, I, I'm not trying to say we know Jack Kennedy, Jack Kennedy was a friend of ours, and look, no one's a, no, you're no Jack Kennedy. Um, no, it's not simply to extol JFK, but to say what this says about the appreciation of science. I think it says as much about Wiesner as it does about Kennedy, and we might argue that John Holdren's list of accomplishments of this administration in science might say as much about John Holdren as it does about Barack Obama. Um, but it's, um, you know, it, it might be easy to dismiss what I've read to you just now as the work of, of Wiesner or clever speechwriters behind an engaging politician. Um, but Wiesner makes it clear that JFK was not a superficial science advocate. Um, some of these Wies ideas, no doubt, are also Wiesner's. Uh, the words might be, in part, Ted Sorensen's. Um, but as Sorensen said, as Sorensen said to me once, uh, you're barking up the wrong tree if you ask who wrote the words or as he put it, ask not who wrote the speeches. Uh, <laughs> rather, we should ask how we can capture the optimism and the scientific thinking that emanated from John Kennedy and pervaded the administration. When Kennedy said, science speaks a universal language, it transcends national antagonisms. 
It's the possession not of a single class or of a single nation or a single ideology, but of mankind. Those are uplifting words that get at the heart of what it is we're trying to promote. What is so special about science? And what do we find today instead in Congress and elsewhere? Ideological denial of science related to climate change, clueless efforts to prevent the application of science in environmental regulations, um, federal funding for research that is less than half of what it was in the mid-1960s as a percentage of gross domestic product, uh, a refusal to regard economics as an evidence-based discipline rather than an ideological forum, a willful avoidance of evolution in biology courses. You know, it's not so much that there half the people don't believe in evolution, half of the teachers choose to avoid it. Not because, well, who knows why, but but willful avoidance of evolution in biology courses from more than half the teachers, and therefore the students are deprived of the best organizing principle, uh, probably the only organizing principle that makes sense in the life sciences. A refusal to revive the Office of Technology Assessment. Um, Confusion between research and development. Um, confusion of science with technological gadgets rather than evidence-based thinking. War making based on political assertions about WMD rather than verifiable evidence. Abuse of the word science in marketing and purchase of dietary supplements, rejection of evidence about the benefits of vaccines. I could go on, you know that list. Science is still held in high regard in this country, but it's eroding, and the fundamental appreciation of science is lacking. You have your own list of where the, how this erosion is taking place, what you hate to see in public figures or in society at large, so what to do. I have a, an old-fashioned word, organize. Scientists and engineers and like-minded people should um, organize. I'm not here to lead a chorus of the Internationale or Joe Hill or something, but uh, I have a modest proposal. Get active in the American Association for the Advancement of Science. As scientists, we need to help each other communicate. We need to recognize and highlight policy and legislative opportunities. We need to sound the alarm when necessary, when there are really atrocious positions taken by politicians. We need to bring expert scientists and engineers to bear on problems. We need to communicate among scientists and between scientists and engineers and the public. Let me read the mission of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. It seeks to advance science, engineering, and innovation throughout the world for the benefit of all people. And to fulfill this mission, the AAAS has set the following goals. To enhance communication among scientists, engineers, and the public. To promote and defend the integrity of science and its use. To strengthen support for science and for the science and technology enterprise, to provide a voice for science on societal issues, to promote responsible use of science in public policy, to strengthen and diversify the science and technology workforce, to foster education in science and technology for everyone, to increase public engagement with science and technology, and to advance international cooperation in science. 
very much along the lines of what John Kennedy and Jerry Wiesner were talking about. I could go into details, I, I won't go on, but I, it's worth noting that in addition to running the s and program uh, and various prizes for science and science journalism and publishing the leading scientific journals in this country, uh, AAAS does outstanding work in professional development of science teachers and the creation and, uh, and assessment of uh, teaching materials, um, works increase the diversity of undergraduate science students, uh, works on human rights and science and the law, um, applying scientific techniques and procedures to uh, uh, international uh, uh, civil liberties, refugee, uh, pl the plight of refugees, cultural artifact destruction, uh, forensic anthropology, uh, you know, using overhead imagery and, uh, and neuroscience. Um, there is ongoing work involving members and uh, fellows and experts on the standards of scientific practice, research ethics, science responsibility, and social responsibility of scientists. Um, AAAS runs judicial seminars for lawyers and judges. Um, so AAAS uh, along the lines uh, that Toby and others have talked about, trained scientists in communications, young scientists, but also uh, more senior scientists. There are the case workshops um, and the uh, program for engaging scientists and engineers that uh, uh, that you heard from uh, an hour ago. This is something that I wish all scientists and all people who care about these things would get involved in. I hear so often, well, what can I do? Uh, you know, uh, you've heard it too. Maybe you've even felt it. Well, what can I do? How do I talk to my school board about the teaching of biology and evolution? How do I engage with members of Congress? Well, organize. You're not alone. AAAS does that. And uh, it is, I, I think it intends to be, and to some extent is, not just the voice for science, but the force for science. Um, who better than the world's largest member-based, multidisciplinary scientific organization? Kennedy said that, let me find this one, one more point to wrap up with. Um, here it is. He said, I know few significant questions of public policy which can safely be confided to computers. In the end, the hard decisions, inescapably, involve imponderables of intuition, prudence, and judgment. But there is a place for scientists. There is a place for evidence-based thinking. He said, as a country, as the country had reason to note in recent weeks during the debate on the test ban treaty, scientists do not always unite themselves on their recommendations to makers of policy. He was saying, organize. That's my message to you. Thank you. Thank you, Rush. Thank you. And by the way, I hope you know that um, 
55 years ago, JFK stood here on the steps of the Michigan Union on a rainy night, arriving a little behind schedule at 2 a.m. There were something like 7,000 people waiting for him. And there was a reenactment of that uh, speech here on the 50th anniversary five years ago. And um, that was the speech that introduced the concept which led to the establishment of the Peace Corps, which is another of his signature developments. Okay, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce next uh, Mary Woolley, a very special friend and a most remarkable woman. She has been, since 1990, the president and CEO of the organization called Research Exclamation Point America. It could be Research America, Research comma America, Exclamation Point. Uh, she will probably give you some background, but um, this is a force for bipartisan understanding and support of uh, scientific investment in this country. It's primarily focused on health and life sciences research, but in the coalition of coalitions in Washington, Research America has worked with many other organizations to try to broaden the pitch and reduce the cacophony for the audiences, especially on the Hill. Um, you have her right up here. She's a member of the Institute of Medicine and prominent member of many other groups. She is a fellow of the AAAS, and um, uh, she's also to be noted a um, graduate of Stanford with a master's from San Francisco State. She had an initial position in clinical research uh, as project manager for one of the really notable large-scale clinical trials ever done called Mr. Fit in Health Promotion and Disease Prevention, Cardiovascular. And uh, she is the master of science advocacy in the world in which she lives. Mary, we're very proud to have you here. Thank you very much. Uh, but just to that point that was raised, um, it reminds me of something that I think it was the University of Arizona did a few years ago, that they started a program of offering to every member of the Arizona congressional delegation someone from the university in the sciences who would work um, on the Hill uh, part-time as an advisor on any topic that involve science and the network through the faculty at the university um, to offer assistance. And um, I, I believe I'm right, although it was a few years ago, that every member of the Arizona congressional delegation took them up on that at one point or another. So that's an example, I think, of what more universities could do. You know, it's more um, it comes from the constituents rather than top down from um, another organization, and may be helpful going forward. So, just a thought. But I, I, I will get to some other thoughts that for universities to consider. And this topic of, um, and although the topic was given to me, mobilizing public support for science and technology investment, I really think that it boils down to earning public support, because we can't just draft public support. It isn't like that. Um, now, John Holdren has left, and I wasn't sure he was going to uh, repeat uh, this message that he did deliver at, when he was the president of the AAAS, and that I use all the time. And it's always, it's always met with some degree of shock or disagreement by members of the science community, partly because they don't know how they could possibly be involved. 10% is a lot of time, first of all, but even if it was 5% or 2%, and everybody did it, it's the power of numbers, everybody getting involved. And I think one of the simplest ways to get involved, um, if you don't have time to do a lot of other things, is to go to a town hall meeting of somebody who is running for office and that could be running for the school board, um, going to a, a town hall for a state legislator or for a member of Congress. But there's lots of other ways as well. It, it is a fact that US politicians don't talk about science. It's very rare that they talk about science. Um, lately, we've been hearing many say, um, I, I don't wanna talk about science. 
But there's a lot of reasons for that, too. And they can be outright ideological, political, if you will, partisan reasons. But the main reason is they're not being asked by their constituents to talk about science. They're not being asked at town hall meetings. What would they do if elected? to confront um, problems uh, along a huge diversity of public need and interest. They're not being asked about it. They sure aren't going to talk about it because they've got lots of other things they have to bone up on and be expert on and talk about every day. But the fact is that public support matters. And President Lincoln, perhaps at the same time that he was founding and chartering the National Academies, when, um, he was, had in mind that it matters quite a lot what the public thinks. They're basically make or break. Good ideas are wonderful, but public support is everything. Public sentiment, he called it. Well, it turns out that public perception of science and scientists is still mostly favorable. They, in um, public opinion polls that we commission and that others commission regularly, uh, it's been holding up, even though there are signs of erosion that's been alluded to earlier. This is just one example. Here's another one. How important is it for the United States to maintain its world leadership role? You can read the rest of it. And you can see that if you add up very important and somewhat important, it's over 90%. I mean, it's basically everybody. This is America. We want to be number one in everything. So the aspiration is still there. And I think that word aspiration is important. I'll get back to it. Um, similarly, for years and years now, since the National Science Board first commissioned studies on this exact question, word for word, um, in 1982, I think was the first time, um, the percentage of strongly agree and agreed has held up at about three quarters. It varies a little bit from year to year. Um, so all those people who are saying, well, people believe in um, translational science or technology, but they really don't support basic research. There is no data su to substantiate that. People do support basic science. Um, and further, uh, they regard scientists, not, this is not an unlikely thing, to be the most trustworthy as a spokesperson for science. Now, they may not think they're all that trustworthy, but compared to others is the point here. Compared to everybody else. We didn't ask, you know, compared to, you know, my mother or my grandmother or something. But you can see here that um, uh, scientists still come out on top. And you can also see that, you know, with healthcare professionals and patient organizers, you can, organizations, you can see the emphasis of our work especially on the life sciences. But you could put other thing, other professions in here, and you'd still get about the same kind of array. And we've done this over and over again over the years. So OK, so this is all good news. But despite all that, I would say, I do say all the time, that scientists are nearly invisible to the public, not just to policymakers, but to the public. So here's an example. We've been asking this question for a number of years now. Please give me the name of a living scientist. Now, in that category of other, there's a lot of dead scientists named. People aren't very clear whether Einstein's still alive. Um, <laughs> truly. And, but to me, the most disturbing part about this is that 70% of people don't even try. They just say, no, I can't give you the name of any scientist. 70%. Now, on the flip side of this, what I think of as a very generous definition of public engagement, 41% of AAAS members who were surveyed and who answered, you know, there's always a, a um, uh, it's always worth remembering that these are volunteers answering, 41% that they said that they engage with the public in at least two ways, at least occasionally. Now, I wanted to find out what, what do they mean by engage? So we found out that that means they, 41% said they talk with non-experts about science topics. 
So that would qualify, let's say, as uh, your grandmother or your spouse, if they weren't a scientist or something. You know, so this is a pretty soft test. Why is it only 41%? But once you see this, you can see why 70% of the general population can't give the name of a living scientist. They can't name a single person. It's pretty deplorable, and it's something we can mobilize ourselves to do something about by self-identifying more often as a scientist. Now, there's some other bad indicators. Most people can't name anywhere where medical or health research is conducted. Skip science generally here for a minute. Medical or health research. 56% just say, nope, can't answer that question. And then you can see what the uh, balance say. It tells you a lot about branding, the power of branding uh, nationally. And this varies a little bit from state to state, by the way. But what doesn't vary is the majority saying, nope, I don't know where medical or health research is conducted. And we've also done this for science broadly, and it's equally bad. People just don't know. It's this invisibility factor. Now we also ask a whole series of questions or have over the years about uh, giving a brief description of the mission statement of a federal agency and then see whether people can tell us what that agency is. Now everybody knows what the IRS is, let me tell you. They say, what's the government, the federal agency responsible for collecting income taxes? We get the right answer there. Now, there's actually good news on this one. We first started asking this question, which was in 1993. Only 4% said the National Institutes of Health when they heard this brief, brief description. 4%. So it's actually improved significantly over the years. I would also say that um, the NIH has done a much better job than it was doing 20 plus years ago um, in branding itself and talking about its mission. But there's still a long way to go. It's been pointed out to me that those who said in this, in this representation that the Department of Health and Human Services are accurate, you know, so in a way you have to add that, but apples to apples. This is another disturbing, but this is the first time we've asked this question, by the way, just in January this year. And it stunned me, absolutely stunned me. We wonder why we have vaccine denials. Um, only 53% of the public says that their family's health has been improved by medical research. Somebody's not connecting the dots here, regardless of who's funded that research. It's not clear to people, half of the people in this country, that they've seen any benefit from medical research. I'd be curious, and we, we will have more opportunities to do this, whether people think they've benefited from science, scientific research. Who knows what they'll say? It's, fine. it's um, something we can find out. We can get an answer. But until these things change, why do we think we're going to get resounding public support for investing more in science? We've got to make people feel that they've, they understand, appreciate, and have benefited from that investment. Then there's another problem. We're constantly delivering double messages, constantly. This was just last week, and I don't mean to pick on the individual who wrote the piece or was heavily quoted in it, but the message was private donors are stepping up to save medical research. Great, so tell me again why we need more public support for it. I've already been asked that by a couple of people on or, near, or working with folks on Capitol Hill. But if you drive around any campus, this one is no exception, you see evidence of a thriving enterprise. Building cranes everywhere, bustle and activity and everything looks terrific. So what's the problem again? You know, so we've gotta think that one through too. But when the public gets engaged, they're absolutely undeniable. Think about HIV AIDS activists. And it was the scientists, remember, who were not so clear that we should be moving so fast in science, funding more of it around the AIDS crisis, as it was called then. 
It was the public who demanded change and the public who got change from both the FDA and the NIH and the government, generally speaking, to huge effect, to huge effect. Similarly, learning from HIV advocates, breast cancer advocates were right behind and then many more behind them. Really made a difference. These were not scientists uh, demanding change. These were public advocates, patient advocates. And then we saw last year the spontaneous public support for the so-called ice bucket challenge um, for ALS. You can't plan something like that, but boy, did it take off. And it did wonderful things for medical research. It called attention to its importance. And that money, though it's nothing like what's needed for ALS support, it will provide support for a lot of young scientists to get a start and to get into the system. It's a great thing. So do we have an opportunity moment right now, despite all the negatives? Um, do we have the opportunity of this symposium to trigger more action so that we can earn and confidently sustain public support? I think it takes a lot of understanding of the public's view of scientists, not what we wish they think about the science community, but what they actually do think about it. it takes accountability and takes connecting a lot of connecting, and that's also known as communicating, which has come up over and over again. Um, getting in touch with the public perception of scientists is something I think about a lot. I went to a terrific session at the recent AAAS um, meeting, Rush, uh, that, where Susan Fisk spoke powerfully. Wow, I was just blown away by this talk, looked up the uh, paper that she recommended to me afterwards. And she was talking about different professions, different occupations, and what they bring out um, in the public. And people have ways of just, we all do, of instantly determining in our own judgment uh, the competency and the intention of any number of people when we first meet them. It doesn't take long at all. And no surprise, politicians are almost never trusted, not you, Rush, others, politicians, sometimes viewed as competent, what can I say? Um, and look at this one. Scientists mostly are considered competent, but cold, which then triggers doubt about their intentions. What, are they don't, what is it they don't want to tell me? What are they holding back? Is this just about more money for their work that really doesn't have anything to do with me? All those little thoughts. That's, she brought out all of those points. And she was asked uh, whether it was possible to change perceptions. And she said yes, um, but it involves demonstrating worthy intent. You can't just assume that. You actually have to demonstrate it, she said. So this fit in with, I thought, with something that we, we at Research America have long recommended to the science community as a way to engage with the public, just a simple thing to remember about communicating effectively with the public. And I asked her about it and she agreed that it made sense as a way to proceed. The point is to say and convey, I work for you. And that point has come up by some of the, uh, from some of the other speakers today about making sure that the science community, the university as an entity, is constantly describing the public's good, is working for the public's good, is saying and conveying that I work for you. Changes the conversation in a, an actually rather profound um, psychological and sociological way that's been demonstrated by Fisk and others. This can change the whole conversation and change support. So when we're talking to, at Research America, we conduct advocacy workshops and public engagement workshops. They're different things, but they're linked. And these are just the simplest prescriptions for it. You can learn how to do this in 15 minutes, or you can really take deep dives over a whole day or, or several days. And it's pretty fundamental stuff. What, the only one you may not recognize immediately is this then, now, and imagine message frame. It's pretty easy, I'll get to it. But one 
um, anecdote, one case that I like to use to describe how very simple actually it is to talk to members of your own family or members of the public about basic science, because that comes up all the time. How can I really um, talk about basic science? It's way too complicated for people to understand. So this is a story that was published in the New York Times by Paul Greengard's sister, who's a journalist. So the key parts here is that she spent her whole life basically not getting anything out of him that she could understand about what his work was about, except she knew he was important. Um, and then after he won the Nobel Prize, a journalist wrote a story saying that the work that Greengard was doing on the way brain cells communicate might one day help cure diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. There's a lot of important qualifiers in here. Might, one day, building on the work of others, cure, help, cure, you know, really. These, things, these words can be said without prostituting yourself or promising things that are never going to happen. It is possible. It is possible to link to something that people care strongly about an eventual cure. This point has been made already. They tell your story, not your data. It happens all the time in, in the Congress, as Toby said, and outside it, and people are lost immediately. The then, now, and imagine frame is so simple. It's about aspirations. And you can apply it to a whole lot of things, not only in the medical and health field, in the biomedical field. You can ask people to think with you, and you can do this in fra three phrases or three sentences, never in three pages or three articles. Um, to go think back to the bad old days, basically, that's how the frame works. Then thanks to science and our investment in research, we are now here at this moment in time, which is demonstrably better. But imagine if we can get to the goal line. Then, now, and imagine. That's all you have to remember, those simple little parts. It works like a charm. We uh, do work of this nature, helping, helping the science community do a better job communicating. We also regularly commission public opinion polls. We offer advocacy internships and fellowships. And we are swamped by people with, with uh, master's degrees, with doctoral degrees, uh, postdocs, swamped with applications. And I think it's partly because we pay people, interns and fellows. And there's a lot of organizations in Washington that don't do that. And I'm uh, in the process of talking to my counterparts in the other science um, agency, not agencies, that sounds like the federal agencies, associations to make sure that they, number one, have interns and fellows and that they are paying them. We owe us, we owe that kind of respect to the science community and to the young people in it. Um, many, speaking of young people, this is a little survey that we did of a relatively small sample, I think it was like 300, um, young scientists. and learn that the reasons they give for um, not getting involved in public communication of science and technology are pretty much the reasons all scientists give. And I hear these anecdotally, and once in a while we've done systematic um, surveys. They don't know how, well, it's easy to fix, actually. Um, unaware of opportunities, another one, very easy to fix. Don't have the training, also fixable. But you shouldn't have to go outside a university to get this training, let me just say. Should be on offer here. Um, they don't have time, well, that's, you can put as much time in on it as you want, or as little. Um, absence of credit toward professional development uh, sort of surprised me on this survey because we hear this anecdotally much more often. It comes out in a different way. Though it's not valued by my mentor, by the leaders in my university, whatever. It's not valued for me to be engaged. And in fact, it's actually discouraged actively. So that, that can and should be fixed. And I know there's work afoot to make that happen. So I've said we do these programs, um, 
lots of them. There's one, the last one, second one listed here, I want to especially emphasize the impact that it had because the presidents of 12 universities in Ohio came to this program. Several members of the congressional delegation came. Many members of the media, people from Washington, but mostly people in Ohio, and talked about the importance of making connections. There were a lot of students there, got a lot of media attention. And it demonstrates, I think, when voices come together, I think it helped empower those members of Congress in ways that few things do around science. So I've already um, mentioned a couple of things universities can do. Here's a few more. Um, you can read them, but down at the bottom, I was, I was suggesting, which I often do, to work with the, the journalism school, or I think here it's called communications, I'm not sure the name of the school. Maybe it's still called journalism school. Um, to make sure that those future members of the media are hearing about science. I don't mean taking courses in laboratories, although a little exposure to laboratory would be a good thing, but rather finding out who their sources are gonna be when the day comes, and the, the day will come soon if they're in the general journalist community. There's very few straight science journalists anymore people who, straight meaning, um, meaning who only cover science. It's gonna be a general assignment reporter who has to cover a science story and will have a deer in the headlight experience not knowing where to go and who to talk to to find out what this story is really about, who's trustworthy and who can speak in ways that non-scientists can understand. It would be enormous to have science, exposure to science courses, science communication in journalism schools and vice versa for science um, majors to have some exposure to what journalism is all about. Because journalism is gonna be with us in some form or another, um, maybe not always the New York Times as we know it, uh, but it's gonna be here always and it's important to public support. Um, finally, we don't want to have most of us getting to this point in their career, the Mike, Mike Bishop speaking when he was chancellor at UCSF, if he had it to do all over again, he'd take more time talking to general audiences. Let's start early and often and reinforce it at the university as well as beyond. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Julia Lane. Um, uh, Jason already referred to her as a mentor and colleague. I met Julia through the Science of Science policy organization and movement, practically, that was uh, well developed in the federal government, I learned, and through the AAAS as well. In 2007 and eight. I chaired a uh, committee for the COSAPUP that was mentioned earlier, the Committee on Science, Engineering, and Public Policy of the Academy, uh, relating to evaluation of research and development in the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, there are methods for evaluating performance, evaluating results, evaluating value, and these metrics are quite in vogue and in some places demanded in order to put a different cast, maybe an independent or objective cast, on the assertions we make about the wonderful developments from any field, including science and technology, biomedical research. So you have the, the bio for Julia. If you don't know what AIR is, it's the uh, American Institutes, plural, for research. I actually looked it up. Make sure. And previously, uh, for many years, she was head of the program at the National Science Foundation on the Science of Science, Science and Innovation Policy Program. I think that evolved over time to that longer title. Um, she has developed something called STAR Metrics. We use this specifically for a uh, report requested by Congress of the National Institutes of Health under the Scientific Management Review Board that I served on recently. And the uh, 
question of how do you evaluate the output, or much better, the outcomes of the investment in research? How do we get maximal value for the dollars invested? That's what logical people want to know. She's a fellow of the AAAS, and while she was in government, she in fact co-chaired a committee of the National Council on Science and Technology that John highlighted, uh, the one, in fact, on science of science policy. So Julia, welcome. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. And um, I'm a very obedient person, so I'm going to speak about what I've uh, been told to speak about, which is why should, uh, uh, ac what should academics know about the science of science policy? Um, and, and having been a, a faculty member for 20 years, in fact, I'm going back to being a faculty member. Rush, I was uh, interested that you were at NYU because that's where I'm going. Uh, I'm going to be a faculty member back at NYU and a provostial fellow. So, um, But uh, the idea is you always tell people what you're going to tell them and then you tell them and then you tell them what you've told them. So that's what I'm doing. So kind of the... the the four things that uh, we should think about with um, building a science for science, it, this, the, the ideas are you want to build a science for science. One of the things that um, surprised me a little bit in the discussions today was how heavy on anecdotes scientists were in describing what they do. I want to unpack that a little bit when I talk about it. Uh, the other thing that uh, I think academics should care about when they're talking about a science of science is um, the amount of manual stuff that scientists do in their day-to-day -day work simply uh, doing things that upper management and the science agencies want them to do which makes no sense in the 21st century. So you should think about using scientific methods to document what science is, and that's so think about reducing burden. You're also going to want to think about improving management. So I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, well, we talked about having more women in science. We talked about different goals. A lot of them were management goals. Well, how could we use a scientific approach to do that? And uh, following on on uh, the very interesting presentations before, how can we better improve the understanding of science from the public? So I'm going to unpack each one of those four ideas. And um, I, I want to emphasize a, a lot of the answers to these questions are hard, right? That's why it's a science of science policy. But scientists shouldn't say, well, this is really hard, this is a problem, we can't do it, right? Uh, we had Rush again talk, science, this is a hard problem, let's solve it. And, you know, this is the United States, we, we like to solve hard problems. So that's kind of the spirit of adventure that I'd like to instill on you in the science of science. And then again, calling back to your thing, it was 10 years ago that Jack Marburger, so back then, that he called for a science of science policy in which there was very little, there was very little evidence uh, out there about what the results of science investments were. We relied very heavily on anecdotes. Now, we have had, with the federal government, and again with the support of Rush, we have had the uh, 100 universities sign up for an initial federal university partnership. We now, today, have 10 universities, 11 universities with the CIC, uh, signed up with the University of Michigan, CIC, Institute for Research on Innovation and Science. Imagine if the universities get together and in three to five years with AAU and APLU support, band together and develop evidence-based science of science policy. So I thought what you did was absolutely perfect for setting me up. Okay, so um, what do we mean by building a science for science? So you heard uh, over and over again today 
well, science does great stuff. So, you know, we spend $30 billion on the NIH. Well, for $30 billion, we'd better bloody well get something, hadn't we? Right? The question is, what did we get relative to the alternative? So what's the scientific method? Well, that's Pasteur's swan flask right there. And that's the classic way in which we evaluate interventions in the queen of social sciences, which is economics. Um, I've got a sociologist sitting there, so I just have to, have to get at him. But, uh, you know, you, you look at two relatively comparable groups, you have an intervention with one group, and then you look at the outcomes relative to the alternative. And so you do a difference in difference, and then it's not just enough to say, well, I got great stuff, it has to be relative to the counterfactual, and you have to do a benefit cost. So if you spend $2 billion versus $2 million, you'd better have a comparable order of magnitude differential impact, because remember, what you're doing is you're bidding away resources from the young and the old. I'm increasingly inclined to worry about the old, right? Uh, but, you know, the, the, this is a very real resource allocation problem, so what's the evidence? So that's what the science of science is about, okay? Just, just a classic approach, and, and we, we do this in a lot of areas. We do it in, in as Jack Margot Mar Mar pointed out, we do it in health, education. We know a lot about differential returns to class sizes. Uh, we do it in international development. We know a lot about the effects of worming, deworming children versus providing textbooks and workbooks. We can do the same thing in science. So if you want to write out what that might look like, you write out what's called a theory of change. Okay? So if you in induce an intervention, what do I think the processes are that are the activities that are generated as a result? And then how do those activities generate the change in the outcomes of interest. So in the, in the bottom side, it's not a mechanical, as Jason put it, put money in, then a miracle occurs, and we get Google, right? What happens? Uh, you have Z, which is the intervention of interest, that is money, and that produces scientific ideas and the communication of scientific ideas through human networks, the interactions of human beings. And obviously there's a lot of noise in that, that's new. And obviously there's uh, other correlates. But as soon as we say that money affects science, then we have a duty to the taxpayer to, to unpack that story. So we need to say something about what beta looks like. And then if y sup 2 is networks or the, 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 the creation and support of scientific bodies, then what we want to say is how does that affect the outcomes of interest, which is y sup 1 And there's lots of serendipity in there, so there's, a, there's an error term. This isn't de deterministic, but we, we need to say something about what that process looks like. And that can be done in many ways. That can be done through case studies, it can be done through uh, econometrics, it can be done through sociological analysis. I'm not being uh, deterministic on the type of approach that should be done, but I'm saying that you can write down uh, what that process is and you can write down what the outputs and outcomes might be. So what do we mean about reducing burden? And that's what the science of science policy is about. What do we mean about reducing burden? I'm very serious about this because there is an increasing tendency of funding agencies who are pressured to describe the results of, of research to make the principal investigator tell stories about what they've done. And to quote a colleague talk, talk about uh, informed consent, what they, but in this particular case, I'm going to argue it's neither comprehensive nor comprehensible, right? So uh, in the United Kingdom, for example, what they do is they are forcing 
the universities through the research excellence framework to write down case studies that describe the impact. So it's like getting, I, I told you what the science of science is, how you do an, uh, an evaluation. That's like getting uh, me to cut up a brain or to build a bridge. I can't cut up a brain or build a bridge because I'm not trained. So having someone who's an engineer or a life scientist trying to describe or evaluate the impact of their science is unlikely to be highly technically uh, sophisticated. Quite apart from the fact that the burden is enormous. This cost the UK for the last ref, it cost 34, 34 million pounds, not counting the burden on the scientists who are busy trying to make this up, plus the universities who hire science writers and so on. This makes no sense. And in the United States, 42%, according to the AAU and FTP survey, of a researcher's time is spent in administrative task. That is probably not a very sensible way of doing things. We live in the 21st century. The type of approach is exactly the type of approach that Umetrics and Iris is doing, which is saying almost all scientific and economic activity occurs electronically. We know how to capture that electronically thanks to our scientist friends in computer science. Let's do it. Let's pull it together. We know how to do it. Filling out forms is neither comprehensive nor comprehensible. So how about improving management? Well, you know, it, again, it occurred to me listening today, we have courses in hospitality management. Right? I'm staying at the uh, um, management school's hotel uh, that's presumably training the very nice help staff on, on how to do hospitality management. In Kentucky, they have courses on equine management. <coughs> When it comes to science management, I haven't heard of classes in science management. It's just that we're really smart and we know how to handle people. And I was reminded of that when John Holdren said Obama put in five Nobel laureates in management positions to manage large science agencies. That is not what you're trained to do when you're, being, when you're running to get a, a Nobel Prize. And so here's a picture of Alex Pine's lab in, um, at, at Berkeley. And so if you go on to any, well, almost all life scientists website, you'll typically see a picture of the lab. In the middle, there'll be the, the principal investigator, who is typically male, pale, and frail. <laughs> and uh, then the, um, you'll see the postdocs, graduate students, and so on. This, looks to me just like a firm. The principal investigator is in the business of selling his or her ideas, right? On the scientific or on the private marketplace. Right. So if we want to study the management of science, we want to study how that, that, how that principal investigator, how that CEO hires staff, how they train the staff, how they buy the different types of equipment, how they manage a portfolio of between two and, and from looking at our star metrics, U metrics data, they look at, they're looking at a thing of two to uh, $10 million. They've got a portfolio of something like that. How are they doing that? How are they trained? So we heard people aren't trained to teach, which we're not, right? It just kind of, uh, how are we trained to manage this massive uh, portfolio which is set up with all these entrepreneurs and has very real consequences for the practice of science and for the training of the future generation without data and without evidence, okay? And we heard again a, a long discussion of, well, how are we going to get more women in science? How are we going to do that? Well, what's happening to those women there? How are they getting trained or mentored or, or uh, people of, of different nationalities like New Zealanders? who feel very underrepresented <laughs> uh, for reasons I don't understand. Uh, it might be the inbreeding with the sheep that caused it. Um, that really was, it's getting late. 
Um, so looking at star metro or eumetrics data for one university, you can start to unpack what's going on there. You could take a look at the share of females on particular grants, because we're matching it with census data, census in, under strong confidentiality protections. And you can see there are a lot of grants where there are no women, right? There are a few grants, there's a few grants that have 100%, but by and large, a lot of grants are no women. So you can match that information with the principal investigators and the gender of the principal investigators, and then you can look at the outcomes of those women, both in terms of publications and their placements and their uh, entrepreneurial startups and their subsequent trajectories over time. Imagine, right? Right now, we've only got a few years of data, so we're able to do limited stuff. We're now getting to the place that we're looking at placements, but we're getting there. Um, it's, a, it's a step on the road. So what are our preliminary results? Well, we found, just very simply, um, but you know, using that counterfactual type of approach, because we've, uh, we've got natural experiments that, we've, that, that you can look at, um, controlling for all, everything else, and doing a difference in differences, women PhD students write approximately 5% fewer papers, who are funded on federal research grants, write approximately 5%. Now that's different and, and significantly lower than the gender differential of 20% recently reported among faculty, and that was written up in the, in the New York Times. Um, but what we find is that working with an all-female team or with uh, female intensive teams and with a female advisor, are they more productive? So what's going on there? Well, you can start to unpack that, and that's what we've started to do, but that's instead of just saying, why don't we have more women in, in, in STEM or what's going on, you can start to unpack that with data. Improving understanding. How can we describe what the results are of of, uh, uh, of research funding, and in terms that the public will understand. So we have done a pretty good job of describing the messages in terms of uh, AIDS research and so on, but a very big issue that uh, stakeholders care about is jobs and entrepreneurial activity. So thank you, Jack, for allowing me to show some of the eumetrics data for the University of Michigan that has been linked to, under statistical purposes only, uh, the placement outcomes of people funded on research grants automatically linked to Census Bureau data, which uh, uses tax records, again, under strict confidentiality protection. So you see where they get jobs, what their earnings are, where their location is, what the industries are, what the productivity and growth of the firms where they get jobs are, and so on. I was told not to go into too much detail on that, but you can tell I, I'm not that docile. Um, so, for example, if you take a look at... So, th this is all done without a single principal investigator picking up a pen. It is done using the cyber tools that Dan Atkins espoused and invested in when he was at NSF at OCI. Um, the first set says, uh, where did they get jobs? So the people who are funded on research funding, instead of just focusing on input, where did they get jobs? So you can see a lot of them got jobs in the great state of Michigan. And when you look at the counties of Michigan, you can see a lot of them got the, stayed in the Michigan local area. But you could do more. It slices, it dices, right? Uh, the, because you have data on all businesses in the United States, you can match it to the businesses that have been started up by the recipients of research funding. And I should hasten to add here, this is not just the principal investigators, it's the graduate students, undergraduate students, postdocs, as they leave the University of Michigan. What businesses do they start up? And by the way, you can also look at their employment and payroll growth and the productivity growth of those firms. In other words, rather than just relying on a Google anecdote, you can pick up every single business that has been started by University of Michigan 
people funded on research grants. You wouldn't ever figure that out unless Google had got really big because NSF only puts out data on principal investigators. Sergey Brin and Larry Page were graduate students or on doctoral fellowships. So you would never have got it without using data like Umetrics. But now you get the whole picture. And so, again, uh, when you look at the entrepreneurial activity of uh, people leaving the great state of uh, great University of Michigan, they have an impact on businesses throughout the country, but also very heavily um, in Michigan. So those are the four key ideas. I know it's usually meant to be three, but I couldn't resist uh, uh, building in the better understanding on science for public. Have a science of science. I agree with Toby, you have to have anecdotes because that puts the flesh on the bones, but let's have scientific bones, not just stories. Reduce the burden. Don't build a, a, a house that is on the backs of the principal investigators and, and the academics who would be better off doing the science to help the country. For heaven's sake, train those poor academics in how to manage teams, which is a non-trivial activity for any of you who run a lab, and think through about how to do better understanding of science by the public. That's why academics should care about science of science. Thank you very much.